This is the birthplace of the rivers. It's meant, it's meant to be the bogs, the springs. It's, it's the the roof of Australia. It's a very sacred place. Today, I want to take you for a flight over Kosciuszko National Park. The high country cops some pretty extreme weather, with gale force winds in the summer, to being covered in feet of snow all winter. The plants and animals here have had to adapt to a lifestyle which is different to species found anywhere else in Australia. Luckily today is clear and sunny, with some turbulence. We're now flying into the north of the park. Kosciuszko National Park gets more rain than 92% of Australia. The creeks below us now are the headwaters of major river systems such as the Murrumbidgee. I've just spotted a large herd of horses feeding at a dam below us. Horses are the reason that I've come to Kosciuszko National Park. They've been in the park since the early 1800s. In recent decades, the horse population has boomed. In the space of just a few years, their population has increased by 30%. It's estimated that the feral horse population is now well over 6,000 individuals. I'm here to investigate the impacts that horses are having on both the landscape and the species found in Kosciuszko National Park. We're now flying over main range this is the highest point of Australia, and for most of the year it's covered in snow. The snowmelt feeds into the rivers and the wetlands, which provide crucial habitat for species found nowhere else on the planet. South of Main Range is some of the most remote wilderness in the park. Winding its way between the mountains is the Snowy River one of the most famous rivers in Australia. This region of the park is wild and steep. The bushland below provides important habitat for a number of bird species. It's been an amazing experience seeing these mountains from the air. But now I want to find out what impacts horses are having on the landscape of the National Park, starting in the north. Teaming up with wildlife filmmaker and photographer David Gallen. David is a passionate conservationist, and today he's helping me set up a number of motion activated cameras across the park. When an animal walks in front of the cameras, they automatically start recording. We're targeting areas that are obviously heavily used by animals. This area has a particularly large amount of damage. So, I'm going to put up the drone to get an aerial perspective and see what's going on.
This creek hardly resembles a creek anymore. It's just mud. Mud covered in horse tracks. And there isn't a single section of this creek that's been left untouched. The damage downstream is even worse. What you're looking at is severe horse damage. It's caused by intensive trampling and the removal of vegetation. It results in a creek that's severely eroded and full of silt. The afternoon brings rain. In the night, it brings storms. In the morning, even more rain. But we have to collect the cameras. Two of the four cameras have been activated. The first, captured a fox. And the second. How many motions was it? 34. So 34 motions, but it got knocked over early. There we go, oh. horse. Awesome, we have a horse. Before coming up behind. Nuzzling the camera. So some results. That's good. That's mm. really good. It doesn't look like much, but you have to remember that there are thousands of horses in the park. Thousands of horses crossing creeks and eating the vegetation, just like we've seen here. I don't think there's a single creek in the north of Kosciuszko that hasn't been impacted by horses. National parks are supposed to be areas where our native species and their habitats thrive. But here, we're deliberately choosing to ignore that and allowing for their habitats to be destroyed. Seeing this section of the park has been incredibly disappointing. And now I'm heading south to see if the situation there is any better. It's early in the morning, and Dave and I are on the banks of the Snowy River. One of the first things I've noticed is just how much horse poo is covering the banks of the river. It's everywhere. In fact, you can't walk anywhere without seeing it. There's two other things I've noticed. The first, there's a lot of weeds here. And the second, the forest away from the river is extremely dry. This area is within the rain shadow cast by main range and it naturally gets less rain than most of the park. 
I'll explain the situation with the weeds shortly. Because Dave has just spotted horses. Now you probably imagine horses running on the banks of the Snowy River to look like this. But the truth is, it looks more like this. Grazing. Constant grazing. Horses are a large herbivore, which means that every day, they need to consume a large amount of vegetation. This is the problem with horses on the Snowy River. There's not enough vegetation to support the high number of horses down here. The horses have ended up outcompeting each other. Now, many are starving to death. And the horses are not just outcompeting each other, but they're also outcompeting the native wildlife. Have a look at this male eastern grey kangaroo. You can even see its bones sticking out of its tail. This kangaroo is in bad condition. And the reason is because it's starving. I mentioned before about weeds. Weeds like this Nagura burr are common along the banks. In fact, sections of the bank are infested with these exotic burrs. The problem here is this is where native vegetation is meant to be growing. Native vegetation that's meant to feed native animals. Horses are once again the root of this issue. The seed of the burr gets caught in the horse's fur and then gets transported along the river. The Snowy River is a beautiful and unique part of Australia. We should be trying to keep this area as wild and as pristine as possible. We've seen the impacts that horses have on the landscape, but now I want to see the impacts that horses are having on individual species, particularly those that are threatened. Today, Dave and I are in the north of the park, where we are looking for suitable habitat for the critically endangered corroboree frog. The corroboree frog is probably one of Australia's most unique species. It's also one of our most endangered. Both species of corroboree frogs, the northern and the southern, are only found in the Australian Alps. Since the 80s, this species has been absolutely hammered by a disease known as chytrid fungus. Captive breeding programs have tried to boost the number of adults in the wild, but so far have very little success. Today, we're searching for the northern corroboree frog. This species needs complex and healthy vegetation. The males build their nest in moss, where the females lay their eggs, and then the males guard them. They feed on ants, so it looks like everything they need is here, but there's one problem. Horses are here too. These soft soiled environments are incredibly susceptible to horse damage. Northern corroboree frogs need dense streamside vegetation. Horses simply trample and eat all of that. By changing the vegetation, it also changes the hydrology. Corroboree frogs need ponds to be full 
or winter, or else their tadpoles don't survive. There are tadpoles in the creek, but these tadpoles don't belong to the northern corroboree. They belong to the eastern froglet, a species of frog extremely good at dealing with habitat disturbance. I'm going to come back to this site in a few weeks. Hopefully, when the weather's warmer, I'll be able to hear corroboree frogs calling. So yeah, Stoggy Galaxies is, um, is critically endangered. This is PhD researcher Hugh Allen. Hugh is currently studying the behaviour of the Stoggy Galaxies. So it's only known from a single, one single location in the headwaters of Tantangra Creek. The stream's about three, three kilometres long and it's a tiny headwater stream. It's about a metre wide and 10 centimetres or so deep. This is the creek he's talking about. It's a small, rocky alpine creek with clear flowing water and thick vegetation. I want to find out what factors are driving this species to extinction. The introduced trout species, so brown trout and rainbow trout, uh, which, have been, which have been in the sort of Tantangra area and, and in Australia since the late 1800s, um, basically they're a ferocious predator and they completely wipe out galaxids. Um, where, where trout are found, there's no galaxids. This six metre waterfall is the one thing stopping trout from reaching the galaxids. It's likely that without this barrier, the galaxids would be extinct and we wouldn't even know about them. So things aren't looking good for the galaxies. And they're about to get worse. What impact do horses have on the life history of the galaxies? So up in Tantangra, I think horse density is the highest in Cozzi National Park. You can clearly see um, horse trails crossing over the river. Um, typically in these spots, streams often wider, sometimes up to two, three, four times as wide as it would be normally. Um, because it's wider, that means that the stream also gets a lot shallower. Um, and the flow velocity is a lot slower. So what that means is that finer sediments, so small silts and sands and gravels, are able to settle out in the stream um, and sort of smother what would otherwise be a sort of cobble and boulder dominated stream. All the little gaps which are found in between cobbles and boulders um, are really important for shelter, for food, and also for the spawning of, of many galaxids, but especially the stocky galaxid. Um, and so if you get those areas smothered by, by finer sediments, then it can potentially lead to inability to spawn and less shelter and less habitat and those sort of things. Yeah, horses are definitely not doing the fish any favors. All right, keen to see these galaxids. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's go fishing. Let's do it. Helping me film today is underwater photographer Jack Breeden. Jack's going to capture footage of the fish underwater in their natural environment. Also, he's from Melbourne, so the cold water's nothing new to him. We're going to be the first people to ever film this species. Hugh also has a helper, his younger brother Liam, who's also studying environmental science. While Hugh and Liam prepare the gear, Jack is suiting up for his first alpine snorkel. Let's go.
In winter, the temperature of the creek sits just above freezing. Luckily for Jack, it's summer, and the water's at around 14 degrees. I'm gonna leave Jack to do his thing, as Hugh and Liam are about to go electrofishing. Hugh does electrofishing as part of his research. It allows him to monitor the health of the fish and to see how many fish are in each section of the creek. Electrofishing is completely harmless to the fish. After a few seconds, they're back to normal, which means that Liam has to catch them fast. Um. With a few fish in the bucket, it's time for Hugh to take some measurements. So the main things we record with the fish that we capture are the length. Um, so we've just got a little measuring board here with a ruler. And we also weigh them on this small set of scales. So that gives us their weight down to 0.1 of a gram. We'll also sort of inspect them for signs of reproductive development um, and the onset of spawning, that sort of thing. And, and if any of them show any sign of disease or poor condition or anything like that. It's important to remember that these fish are found nowhere else in the world, just this creek. So Hugh's records are essentially of the entire species. Once records are complete, the fish are released into the same section of the creek where they were caught. Jack's been in the creek for four hours now, and I think the cold's finally gotten to him. How'd you go? Yeah, good. Bit sunny to tell at the moment. Have to look back at it on the computer later. Did you get hypothermia? Um, almost. It's bloody cold. <laughs> Jack's footage reveals, for the first time, the underwater world of the stocky Galaxius. It's easy to see how this species got its name. Adults are quite a robust and attractive fish. Juveniles are currently feeding as much as they can, trying to put on as much weight as possible before they go into their first winter. Hugh estimates that there's around 2,000 adult fish left in the entire species. Before we go, there's one last thing that I need to find out. The impact of horses on the stocky Galaxias. So where you've got these areas where all the cobbles and boulders have been filled, all the space between the cobbles and boulders has been filled with sediment, then it leaves not a lot of areas which are suitable for spawning. These guys, they use large sort of clean cobbles and boulders as shelter and food, but they're also critical for their spawning. So the silt is, uh, yeah, can be very detrimental for the spawning success of the species. There's over 50 of these horse crossings throughout the creek. Each one adding a little bit of pressure to a species which is already struggling just to exist. If breeding is unsuccessful, then obviously the species is going to decline. A couple of years in a row of unsuccessful spawning could potentially have, have large effects on the whole population and and given that there is only one population, the whole species. We're gonna leave Hugh and Liam to continue electrofishing. Meanwhile, we're on the hunt for another critically endangered species, the Northern Corroboree Frog. So I've been coming to this spot a few times throughout this project and the reason that I keep coming here is because I was told a few years ago um, there was actually some monitoring done here of northern quabbery frogs and it's known that they are in this area. And every time I come back here the creek just seems in a worse condition than the time before. 
Um, and it seems pretty obvious to me that this, the impact that horses are having is cumulative. It's just constantly getting worse. And I just don't understand how, how we would put a species that is, that is feral, an introduced species that is clearly a key threatening process to a species as unique and charismatic and endangered as the Kauri. Having been in this part of the country only two days, I've seen both pristine environments and horse ridden environments and the impacts are fairly obvious. The creeks are degraded, their banks are falling in and even a complete lack of native fauna. Um, today we drove into this part of the Kosciuszko National Park and we saw two kangaroos but we also saw hundreds of horses and cows. Got everything? Yep. All right, let's go. As always, the creek here is in a pretty terrible state. Most frog species need healthy water in order for their tadpoles to survive. We're trying to locate corroboree frogs using their call. This isn't a corroboree frog, but at least it's something. This is called a clicking frog or an eastern froglet. The tadpoles from earlier belong to this species. Jack's found another species of frog. This one's called Dendy's toadlet, and it's actually quite closely related to the corroboree frog, except it's much more common. The only other animal we can find is this big brush tail possum. I've spent hours searching for the corroboree frog, and still nothing. If we want this species to survive in the future, we need to protect its habitat. How can a species on the brink of extinction make a recovery if it has nowhere to live? Before we leave these mountains, there's one last thing Jack and I would like to see. Just downstream, on the banks of the Murrumbidgee River, Najong, a traditional water healing ceremony is taking place. The mountains have been treated poorly because there's a twisted view of what is heritage and what is culture. Today was a water healing ceremony in, in traditional way, but in a statement way it was also asking modern Australians to embrace that the very land you're standing on this country that's your heritage. <laughs>